If you had looked from here in 1750, you would have seen the tall masts of many ships. Ships which had harnessed the westerlies of the Irish Sea and skirted the Welsh coast, heading for the major port of the northwest. If you had watched from here in 1950, you'd have seen a river full of cargo ships and great liners on their way to and from all the continents of the world. But now, these things have gone. They're part of a glorious past. And a visitor to Wirral might be forgiven for thinking its heyday was over. But there are those who know it better. There are those who know that wrapped within these shores is a magic so timeless that the heady days of the 1750s or the 1950s were no more than blinkings of the eye. There are those who know that here is something quite special. Through the years, Wirral has inspired dreams and visions in many people, including several wealthy men. And it was near the red and yellow noses that one of these dreams began. In 1830, James Atherton, a retired builder from Everton, bought 170 acres of land above the noses. He had a grand scheme for creating an exclusive seaside resort. It would be something quite exclusive, something with an air of affluence, something reminiscent of a south coast resort. Another Brighton, a new Brighton. He could certainly see the potential of this little corner. In his prospectus to attract investment, he wrote, the sands are hard and clean, free from mud, gravel, or quicksands. There are many miles in extent and cannot be equaled for the purpose of exercise, whether in carriages, on foot, or on horseback. He undoubtedly had the noble and the wealthy in mind, but the really unique attraction of this place was something more than just fine sands. New Brighton also possesses a more interesting sea view than any other watering place can boast, being constantly enlivened by the passing of vessels to and from the rich and flourishing port of Liverpool, in many instances approaching so near as to admit of persons on the shore conversing with those on board. But James Atherton's dream of a resort of refinement and elegance did not take account of one simple fact, a fact which is so obvious with the benefit of hindsight. If wide white sands and ships sailing by were an attraction to wealthy people, Surely, lesser beings might like the idea as well. And they certainly did. Within a few short years, rows of cheap boarding houses had sprung up, and New Brighton had become a firm favorite with working people of the Northwest. but it also attracted undesirable attentions. For a time, this was most in evidence around Aquarium Parade, better known as the Ham and Egg Parade. This cluster of seedy cafes and the accompanying tatty sideshows on the shore became the scene of drunkenness and frequent brawls. This was doing no favors for the reputation of New Brighton. So it was much to the relief of nearby residents that in 1905, the ham and egg parade was pulled down and replaced with the much wider marine promenade. In its time, New Brighton has been the focus of many grandiose schemes. Some came to fruition, some came to nothing. 
most spectacular was an audacious bid to outshine its biggest rival town in the north. New Brighton Tower, built between 1897 and 1900, rose 562 feet from ground level and stood head and shoulders above its counterpart at Blackpool. At the base of the slender structure, a red brick building housed a large ballroom and theatre, cafes and restaurants. This would form the focal point for a paradise of leisure, recreation and entertainment. But the optimism didn't last long. During the First World War, there was no maintenance carried out on the tower. But that was only part of a complex story behind the dismantling which then took place. The great landmark at the head of the Mersey disappeared. The distinctive skyline of New Brighton had gone forever. The fine open sands that James Atherton brought so much attention to were indeed a pride and joy to the people of New Brighton and Wallasey. So the council had a grand scheme for them. Why not build on top of them? So a vast promenade was built, stretching from New Brighton to Harrison Drive. Seats were incorporated all the way along. But if you sat down, you wouldn't be able to watch the great ships as they passed you by. They'd be behind you. And just in case you tried to get a good look at those ships, solid walls were put there instead of railings. However, behind these slight omissions, there was indeed a grand project. Along the wide stretch of claimed land, there would be impressive hotels and other buildings, and so that no one could dispute that this was a project on a truly majestic scale, it was named King's Parade. To get things off to a flying start, a huge, stylish, open-air swimming pool was built, the biggest in Europe, and this was followed by nothing. Another dream that ended nowhere. The catalogue could go on. There was never a shortage of bold and wonderful ideas for New Brighton. Ideas that could really have put it on the map. But we could look back and argue the reasons why they never took off. But then we could say that, over the years, millions of people have come here and have spent happy hours which they wouldn't have changed for anything. For so many of us, there is still a remembered magic about New Brighton. A childhood fantasy of a place which seemed so perfect. The castles in the sand we built as children proved more substantial than the castles in the air dreamed up by successive generations of adults. Long before fun and entertainment became the business of this shoreline, it was a much more serious business, evading the customs men. And there was one house in particular which became infamous for its part in smuggling. Old Mother Redcaps stood at the edge of the shore. Behind the house, there stretched inland a wild, lonely expanse of heath, gorse and turf known as Liscard Moor. The house and garden was crammed with secret places for hiding people and goods. Nooks and crannies formed within the thick walls, cellars, caves, underground passages. The name by which this notorious inn was best known comes from its most famous owner, a Cheshire woman who generally wore a red cap or hood. She managed the hostelry during the latter part of the 18th century and seemed to have the entire trust of those sailors and smugglers who made up her main custom. Sailors, on their return from voyages, would deposit their pay and prize money for her to hide until they needed it. Of course, the customs men probably had their suspicions about Mother Redcaps. Certainly, they visited the place often enough. But alas, their presence was well advertised to all who might wish to avoid them. The weather vane outside changed direction frequently, but it had nothing to do with the wind. If it pointed away from the house, it was a signal that a customs officer was inside. If it pointed towards the house, then the coast was clear. 
Even if an officer had firmly ensconced himself in Mother Redcaps, there was always some scheme for bypassing him or even removing him. One wrecker crept down from the moor onto the beach some distance from the house and laid down at the water's edge, pretending to have drowned. The officer was told about the finding of a body washed ashore. He ran along to investigate as an officer doing his lawful duty would be expected to do. Arriving on the spot, he promptly attended to the body. By taking his watch and rifling through the pockets, the wrecker quickly gave up the play-acting, jumped up and knocked the officer down. Now the work in hand could get underway with the eye of the law firmly shut for a while. A cask of rum and goods was opened and removed from the cellar to begin the journey towards Bidston Moss. No blame at all was attached to the drowned man who said he had fallen in a fit and had come round to find that he was being robbed. It would be interesting to know the officer's side of the story. Among the spoils of one wrecking were several bales of silk stuffs which were duly concealed in Mother Redcap's cellar. They were later distributed amongst the villagers of Liscard, Wallasey and Bidston. When the warmer weather arrived the following summer, there was an outbreak of extravagant and exotic fashion. Quite noticeable on simple villagers. There was also an amazing similarity. The last days of Mother Redcaps were ones of doubt and uncertainty. Some 20 years ago, the vandalized building was demolished. Now the much revered name lives under another guise. Only odd remnants of stonework remind us of the old building. There is, however, an upbeat note. Old Mother Redcap had strong family associations with nursing. That tradition, at least, still lives on. From these sands around Mock Beggar, there stemmed a trade far more iniquitous and shocking than smuggling. A trade for which the north coast of Wirral became infamous. Those who sailed into Liverpool Bay must have prayed to be spared from the evil deeds of the wreckers. At dusk on the 26th of October, 1820, the schooner Mary Betsy was approaching the mouth of the Mersey when a wild gale blew up. In spite of the efforts of the crew, the boat ran aground near to Liso Castle. Several of the crew were lost trying to launch a small boat onto the angry waves. The remaining sailors sought refuge by climbing the rigging. In the first light of morning, the drenched and exhausted men could look down and see the tide receding. But they could also see something else, something rather less welcoming. As soon as the waters permitted, the crowd boarded the schooner, looted the cargo and stripped her of all items of value, including ropes and sails. This was one of the last reported cases of the looting of wrecks. Tales abound of much more violent occasions in earlier times. Times when ships caught in storms were deliberately lured onto the Hoyle or Burbo banks and then plundered. On some occasions, they would think nothing of disposing of the crew who were seen as unwanted witnesses. All this was long ago. But there have been times when those bad old days have been brought back to mind. During the building of the palace at New Brighton, a pit was discovered which had almost certainly been used by wreckers to hide their ill-gotten gains. There was also a foul stench, so sickening that huge amounts of disinfectant had to be used to allow the work of clearing the pit to continue. The authorities have never fully revealed what was found, but it's generally believed that they were human remains, probably of sailors whose bodies might have given rise to some rather awkward questions. If these tales which are told and retold across the Wirral seem only to be the sinister result of ghoulish fantasies, we must remind ourselves that we live in a comparatively civilized and law-abiding age, even though we don't always think it. And we cannot conclude that all those who took part in the looting of wrecks were criminals. The evidence is that many of them were decent, ordinary people who saw their gains as a windfall, a gift from the elements, a cause for celebration. 
And what a celebration there was in November 1866, when a bark ran aground on the Burbo bank. The following morning, her cargo of coconuts and casks of rum began to drift ashore at New Brighton. The five available policemen could do nothing to stop the eager crowd from having their impromptu beach party. After a while, those policemen were kept busy dragging the inebriates to safety away from the advancing tide. West Kirby has made quite a name for itself as a centre for windsurfing. And what a fine setting it is. What a way to capture the wind while releasing the adrenaline flow. But from West Kirby, there is another way to taste that air and lift the spirits. There is always a feeling of adventure in striding out across the sandy flats towards the islands of Hillbury. The wind coming sharp from the Irish Sea and the prospect of discovering yet again that you really can get away from it all, providing it's not a weekend, a bank holiday or a hot summer's day. But choose the right day and any visitor can begin to feel the peace of this trio of islands. Throughout the country, this patch of sand, sandstone and water is celebrated as the haunt of many species of birds of the sea and estuary. The haunt of who else? Perhaps the spirit of monks who lived centuries ago in this quiet solitude. And who else? When we look at this cave, which faces out across the water towards the point of air, we can begin to ponder on the story which tradition tells us about the place. A sad tale, which makes us wonder if the good old days really were that good after all. For it was here, many years ago, that one of the Benedictine monks stationed on the island came across a dying young woman cast up by the sea. And it was here that the legend of the Lady Cave began. Not so long ago, her days had been the most blissful she had ever known. The only daughter of the custodian of Schottick Castle, she was in love with Edgar, her friend from childhood, whom her father had made into one of his esquires. Surely these were the days for which her whole life had been prepared. One must serve loyally and with one's entire heart as best one can. This is why I want to serve my true love loyally and without regret. And why I shall all my life long for I have placed heart and soul at his command. But her father had other plans for her. Plans that would elevate both his daughter and the social connections of the family. He had arranged that her hand be taken in marriage by no less than a knight of high birth. Although she protested bitterly and pleaded with her father, he would hear none of it. And it was on the voyage to meet her unwanted suitor that her father was to make such a fatal error of judgment. In an attempt to calm her protests, he announced that he'd received news that Edgar was dead. Perhaps, he thought, this would be the first step in persuading her towards his way of thinking. But alas, no matter how much he tried to comfort his daughter, she became inconsolable. She threw herself overboard into the cold waters close to the point of air. In the turmoil of the water, 
she fancied she heard her father calling that the news of Edgar's death was a lie and that she could marry the one she really wanted. But it was too late. Those swirling waters washed her away across to the shores of Hilbury Island. Loyal lovers never feign love, nor do they even complain day or night of love's sweet pains, no matter how much they suffer. You may hear different versions of the tale, but as with many ballads and folk songs, it is not the literal truth which matters. It captures the mood and traditions of a bygone age when the serious business of socially devised marriages took little account of feelings of the heart. The A41, the old trunk road between Merseyside and London, which nowadays offers a fairly quiet backwater route to the capital. The section outside Birkenhead may not be the most picturesque part of the journey, but what it lacks in rural charm, it more than makes up for with its industrial and social history. On one side is the world-famous model village of William Hesketh Lever. On the other side is a village which lies eclipsed and almost forgotten in its shadow. Bromborough Pool was also known as Price's Village. It was built for the workers at Price's Candle Factory by the owners, James and George Wilson, who were brothers and devout Christians. They saw themselves as having a moral responsibility for the total well-being of their employees. And so, in 1853, they began the building of homes well above the standard of other workers' houses at the time. And in a similar way to Lever, the Wilsons developed the wider aspects of village life by building a school, a church, a village hall, and a hospital. Most notable of all, perhaps, was the lively feeling of community which these pioneers of enlightenment managed to create. And this was begun 35 years before the first brick was laid in Port Sunlight. But it never achieved the scale or the completeness of that village. The Wilson brothers never had the financial power to realize their dreams to the full. But Bromborough Pool is still a fine reminder of those qualities of care and generosity which elevate us all. The story of Port Sunlight began in 1887 when William Hesketh Lever, a successful soap manufacturer, was looking for land to expand his fast-growing business. He decided on a stretch of unpromising land south of New Ferry, and from here, he built a great business empire. But much more than that, he turned his own dreams of a better society into a reality. He'd been appalled by the conditions and quality of life which were the lot of so many of the people of Liverpool and Birkenhead. A child that knows nothing of God's earth, of green fields, of sparkling brooks, of breezy hill and springy heather, and whose mind is stored with none of the beauties of nature but knows only the drunkenness prevalent in the hideous slums it is forced to live in and whose walks abroad have never extended beyond the corner public house and the pawn shop cannot be benefited by education. Such children grow up depraved and become a danger to the state, wealth destroyers instead of wealth producers. With these thoughts, Lever began to turn a dream into a reality. In 1888, building started on this unpromising site and 20 years later over 700 houses were in use and these were no ordinary houses for working families they were designed to be of high and individual quality tastefully identified with features of character and interest a walk around port sunlight today can still surprise us at just how many variations there can be of a roof a window or even a chimney stack and then to realize that all this dedication to the decorative and the attractive was on behalf of workers in the local factory over a hundred years ago, it must make us wonder if we've really made a century's worth of progress since. 
However, Lever did not regard the physical needs of a dry roof, warmth and good drainage as the be-all and end-all of people's existence. He recognized that there were social, moral and spiritual dimensions to his workers' families which could be catered for. And so he developed amenities which he considered vital to the cultural well-being of his village. A church, schools, a cottage hospital, a village hall, a residence club, a girls' club, an auditorium and so on. And in a dominant position resembling an elegant old coaching house, the village pub with no beer. This was not the quirky notion of a committed teetotaler. Lever had seen the devastating effects of alcohol upon men, their lives and their families. At the same time, he wanted to be fair. So in response to a little pressure from some of the residents, he held a referendum just a couple of years after the Bridge Inn had been completed. The result? The village pub could now sell alcohol. Probably the most endearing building of all is the Lady Lever Art Gallery. This was his special gift to the village, a memorial to his wife and a delight to each new generation which discovers it. One hundred years on, Port Sunlight stands testament to a man of great humanity and vision. Above most other men who had grand plans for Wirral, he had the resourcefulness and tenacity to see his dreams take shape and resound across the world. But isn't there a tantalizing thought that lingers when you look at the Port Sunlight of today? With all his perceptiveness and instincts for knowing what was right for the time, how would he have changed the village and its management had he still been alive? Or might he have started all over again somewhere else? That would have been a sight to see. Like many villages in the peninsula, Burton has curiosity as well as charm. A walk through the churchyard will set the scene for one of the unsolved mysteries of Wirral. But it's not the one-handed clock on the church tower. Although interesting, it is not unique. And the graveyard is orderly and peaceful, an oasis of calm. However, if we wander a little way into the woods behind the church, we find two old graves outside of the consecrated ground. Why are they here? Were the occupants spurned by the church and villagers for some reason? They are known as the Quaker graves, which has become the popular explanation for this strange position, so close to the churchyard, yet so definitely excluded. If these people were Quakers, then it is quite possible that their souls were regarded as beyond the pale. But alas, there is no evidence of any Quakers living in the area during the late 17th century. The story behind this oddity is still waiting to be told. Meanwhile, the sleep of all these forefathers of Burton, whether in consecrated ground or not, is bound to be peaceful in such an idyllic setting. Wirral abounds with tales of people from the past who have been reluctant to leave their worldly existence behind. How many drivers arriving at Spittle Crossroads from the Dibbinsdale direction would know that they've been passing through just such a person's favorite haunt? If you were driving along this stretch of road late on a dark winter's night, you might just catch sight of the dark figure of a lady waiting at the roadside. She has often been seen at this bend in Poulton Road. The only feature which would mark her out is her long coat and a general air of the 1940s about her. Who she is and why she is waiting there is a mystery which so far remains unsolved. Hoside Road in Wallasey, best known for the captain's pit. Here are waters which have sad associations. To any passerby, this is simply a pond where children get their first experience of fishing. And generations have gone before them 
catching Jack Sharps by the jam jar full, taking them home, and then, alas, watching them all die. But probe a little further, and there is a story of how the captain's pit got its name. To follow the story, we have to go a few hundred yards into Seaview Road. Here, you can find a couple of side roads whose names give a clue as to what was here before. Look up towards the rooftops and the hint of pinnacles and turrets should take all doubts away. This was the site of a large house known as Liscard Castle. Actually, it was no more a castle than the houses which stand there today. But its design did give it something of a castle appearance. One occupier was a seagoing captain and his devoted young wife. It was from one of his voyages that she received the news that he'd drowned. In her shock, she tore about the house, screaming his name. She raced from the front door, ran towards the pond, and took her life in its quiet waters. Here, amidst the calm of these reflections, she must have found the only peace she could have hoped for. And so, according to tradition, the pond became known as the Captain's Pit. The days of smuggling are still kept alive in the gullies which reach down to the shore at Thurstaston. On a stormy night in these parts, you might hear a wild howling. But could you be sure it is just the wind? Tradition has it that these gullies are haunted by smugglers killed by excise men, who, in those days of very rough justice, might well have found it easier to administer on-the-spot sentences. Of course, those more doubtful about these spiritual goings-on might wonder just how far their belief can be stretched. Well, perhaps they might consider the case of the duck that haunted Stanny. Some time ago, it doesn't matter how long exactly, it became common knowledge that the duck which roamed these lanes and harried passers-by was indeed no ordinary duck. It was a ghost. It caused such a nuisance that the local parson was called in to exorcise it. But no, that phantom duck did not want to have his problems solved or be coaxed away from his favourite haunts. The village butcher, amongst others, was not very amused. No duck, living or dead, had ever got the better of him. He patiently lay in waiting along the favoured stretch, and when the moment came, took one well-aimed swing with his cleaver and beheaded the hapless soul. To make sure that the duck would cause no more trouble, the butcher buried the severed head in a nearby ditch. Everyone was now very happy, but not for long. Now the locals really had something to talk and scream about. A busy main road in front of your house can sometimes get to be too much. And if you really can't stand it any longer, you have no option but to move. That is, unless you happen to be Sir Thomas Ismay, and you're the extremely wealthy founder and chairman of the White Star Shipping Line. In 1880, he bought a house called Door Pool, snugly sheltered under Thurstaston Hill. From there, he could enjoy the fine open view across the Dee to Wales. Stretching down to the shore were fields, his fields. But there was also the main road from West Kirby to Heswall to mar his outlook. The solution was obvious simply move the road, and this is exactly what was done. At Ismay's own expense, the road was cut into the rock behind his house. Nowadays, this well-known cutting makes an attractive feature along the road to West Kirby. Anyway, Sir Thomas could now enjoy his uninterrupted rural prospect. But for how long? A railway was planned to run down the west side of the Wirral parallel to the road. So how much could he influence this threat to his domestic peace? Well, quite a lot, really. After all, he was chairman of the railway company concerned. So it was rerouted much closer to the river. 
in fact, so far in front of Dorpool that it didn't matter. Consequently, Thurstiston Station wasn't very handy for Thurstiston, but it was convenient for the shore. These diversions may have been made to suit the whims of one man, but they've served us all. The tiny village of Thurstiston has been able to slumber on, unspoiled and undisturbed. It is now an oasis of charm, which we have all inherited. It is difficult to believe that before the silting up of the Dee, this was the most important seaport in the northwest. Parkgate thrived at a time when Liverpool and Birkenhead were of little significance. Two hundred years ago, you could have stood here and watched the tall sails disappear out of sight as the ships made their way out into the Irish Sea. Some of the greatest names are associated with Parkgate. The story goes that the composer, George Frederick Handel, was delayed here by heavy seas while on the way to Dublin for the first performance of his Messiah. During his enforced stay, he took the opportunity to put some final touches to his masterpiece while high winds raged across the Irish Sea. It sounds romantic, doesn't it? But unfortunately, it isn't true. It is one of those Wirral myths that people like to keep alive. Certainly the weather was unfavorable. So Handel moved on to Chester and stayed at the Golden Falcon Inn. During his time there, he made some revisions to his score. He then went on to sail from Hollyhead, a much shorter crossing than from Parkgate. However, he did return via Parkgate. At the end of Station Road is Dover Cottage, where it is believed that Emma Hart, born in nearby Ness, made a brief stay in June 1784. She was soon to become Lady Hamilton, and after that, to find fame as the mistress of Horatio Nelson. If we move one door along from that house, we find one which has no link with the illustrious, but it has a story all of its own. This simple inscription does indeed commemorate someone called Nelson, but not, as you may be led to believe, the great admiral. This Nelson was the son of Albin Burt, a Chester artist who used to rent this cottage. He must have had some admiration for the celebrated couple because he called his son Nelson and his daughter Emma. In December 1822, Albin and his son were crossing the Mersey from Liverpool to Ellesmere port in a storm when the paddle steamer struck a barge and began to sink. Nine people were drowned, including the captain and the nine-year-old Nelson. The grieving father buried his son at Stoke, the nearest churchyard to the scene of the tragedy. Later, he collected pebbles from the shore alongside the Dee and set out his son's name in front of the Parkgate Cottage as a memorial. Bidston Observatory, one of two well-known landmarks on Bidston Hill. The other, of course, is the windmill. There can be few sights in Wirral as evocative and stirring as this. No matter how old we become, there is always enough of the child in us to feel the old world magic as we approach. For many generations of children, the musky darkness beyond the locked door was a secret. Today's children have no such problem. The mill is regularly opened so that visitors, young and old, can climb the ladders and thrill at the wide views across Wirral. It is believed that the great painter Turner, when visiting Sir John Fleming Lester at Tabley Hall, would make excursions to Bidston Hill to study the effects as the sun rose and set over the rivers on either side. How many of his paintings might have been inspired, at least in part, by the skies and play of light over this hill?
but there was one man for whom the captivating charms of Bidston Hill were not enough. If you'd passed through these gates in the early 1920s, you'd have been entering the grounds of a fine house, a house with stately terraces and unrivaled views across the Wirral. Now the terraces and paths lie aimlessly and rather forlornly. So what has happened to the house? Well, it didn't go far. In 1929, the owner, Sir Ernest Royden, ordered for it to be dismantled and rebuilt piece by piece amidst the greenery and grassy slopes of Frankby Hill. This large area of land had recently come into the possession of Lady Royden. It offered a more open and rural site than Bidston Hill, where the expanding boundaries of Birkenhead were beginning to encroach. This is Hill Bark, and if you notice any similarity in parts to Morton Old Hall, it is not surprising. The famous hall was used as a reference for this design. Whatever we find in Wirral by way of stories, mysteries and curiosities, we will always come across corners which offer us no more than the simple pleasure of looking. Our search into the secrets has only just begun. Perhaps there will never be enough time. But for those who have a taste for a journey of discovery, the wide white shores and quiet green byways are waiting. And if today has been too hectic or tiring, there is always tomorrow. The secrets, the dreams, the romance will still be there.